Greetings Dragon Ball fans and welcome to part 3 of What If Goku's Spirit Bomb Actually Worked, where the Spirit Bomb does its job a bit more effectively the first two times it was ever used, killing its respective targets in as spectacular a fashion as all that build-up implied it should have. Aside from the movies, the death toll from that attack now includes both Vegeta and Frieza. With Namek itself remaining intact, Bulma laid claim to Frieza's capital ship as the legitimate salvage that it was, and the Namekians were left with the partially functional remains of the child of Katas's old ship from Earth. With no Yardrat in sight, and now back on Earth, the Heart Virus's initial attack was thwarted by some quick-to-market healing chambers, courtesy of the shamelessly duplicated technology from Frieza's ship. However, like many a side character or minor villain whose death comes with little overt evidence, the thing was not entirely cured. It laid in wait, biding its time, rebuilding, and just to be topical in 2020 or 2021, when I finally get around to publishing this, maybe it even mutates a bit before choosing the worst possible moment to say hi. The still non-Super Saiyan Goku, right in the middle of fighting off the cyborgs, 17 and 18, with his Kaioken cranked up to max. The decimation of the Z fighters that followed put Gohan in a desperate place. Feeling responsible for killing Vegeta, and then some Frieza Force soldier, he had been increasingly uncomfortable with his growing power, so had all but cast aside his training for a more peaceful and less murderous lifestyle that Chi Chi, for one, was happy to encourage. Finding the remains of the Z Fighters, however, pushed the still relatively powerful boy over an oh so familiar edge, likely wrecking what little remained of the town near South City in the process. After recovering from that emotional collapse, Gohan was dispatched to Namek to attempt to revive at least Piccolo, and thus Kami, yet again. However, he arrived to find the planet a barren, lifeless rock. King Cold, it turns out, had come looking for his son, and as they were unable to produce him in any shape or form, and also refused to hand over the Dragon Balls, not to mention the password needed to access the things, Cold had employed the Ginyu Force to start wiping out the remaining Namekians. Those few who managed to escape in the old Namekian ship then vanished into the depths of space. Back at, or above, the almost equally decimated Earth, Gohan set about training the next generation. Since Goku had returned early, Goten was born early, and having hung around Bulma during her deep dive into all that cool Frieza tech, along with the absence of Vegeta, Yamcha's and Bulma's eventual union means that Bra is also on hand. After years of Gohan scouring the planet below for survivors and supplies for their makeshift orbital station, both the kids were eager to help. Once they graduated to a decent enough power level, they too could venture to Earth's surface and back under their own steam. Unfortunately, Gohan's increasing reluctance to take them planetside, for fear of the cyborgs' increasing tendency to track them down, their desperation to help more than their master and the blind old cripple Roshi were willing to let them, caused the pair to start sneaking out. Of course they found themselves in a tight spot on the very first such clandestine salvage run. Fortunately, they were rescued in the nick of time by Gohan. Thinking the pair dead, Gohan's anguish and rage again pushed him through to that mythical state, and he battled 17 and 18 as best he could. Sensing a legitimate threat this time, though, they switched from playing to putting him down, lest he ruin their fun. With his stamina rapidly fading, Gohan finally saw that all was not lost. The kids were alive, and determined that they at least would survive, he grabbed the cyborgs around the waist, and summoning what he could to make up for his many failings as Defender of Earth, he pulled a Vegeta. When Gohan and Bra finally managed to dig their way out of the rubble that protected them from the brunt of Gohan's blast, they sit for a moment just looking around. If East City thought Nappa's blast had been decent, they would surely have appreciated this. Where once there was miles of rubble and broken buildings, now there was nothing but a glass-smooth crater. The kids couldn't really appreciate it, though. All they could see was a thick fog of pulverized dirt and building, slowly settling down around them. I hope whatever healing chambers they have on that coupled together spaceship are good at cleaning out people's lungs. They are startled when they hear movement near where Gohan and those machines used to be, now at the center of the crater. They trudge through the cracking layers of flash burnt dirt and stop when they finally see what's making the noise. A slender hand is clawing and digging its way to the surface, a hand that sparks and crackles as it moves. The female one, bloody, scorched and broken, drags itself out and lays on its back on the ground, seeping a variety of liquids in addition to the electrical discharges. Its eyes swivel to watch as Goten leaps in and starts digging nearby, kicking up even more dust and ash as he searches for his brother. Then, in a broken mechanical voice, what's left of the woman-like thing says, Don't bother. Goten rounds on the sound, and with his grief, turning to rage, his hair flickers momentarily bright, and he moves towards the broken shell in a flash, stomping on that barely functional arm. 
The thing collapses, sparks emitting from what's left of its limb, along with the other parts as he strikes at it. Bra watches for a time, trapped between her own fear of the machine and what she can feel from her only friend. She eventually reaches for Goten's arm and carefully tries to pull him away from beating on what little remains of the cyborg's torso and head. You'd be forgiven for thinking she was trying to be more gentle than careful, but having been trained fairly extensively, her senses are a bit overwhelmed by the raw, uncontrolled power of her friend in this strangely golden-haired state. She knows only that she needs to be careful if she doesn't want her fingers ripped off as he winds up for the next punch. Fortunately, her touch and voice are enough to break through Goten's haze of anger and swing it back to grief and guilt. So he stops, collapsing to the rim of the small crater he'd been busy carving out with each successive hit. In the opposite rim of that crater, they can see a scrap of cloth, what's left of Gohan's jacket, with the Capsule Corp logo smudged and torn, but unmistakable. Cradling the cloth, they both sink into each other's arms and cry for a time. They cry until the dust and ash that was washed away by Goten's little outburst start to reach back in, making them cough as an almost welcome distraction to their misery. When they arrive back at the ship, through more tears, they relay the news, and if they were remotely capable of it, they might have found it surprising that they were not being told off. They would have expected shouting and accusations, but Chi-Chi is far too busy being slumped against the bulkhead, crying softly. And while Bulma initially tries to look sternly at them, she can see that they're already punishing themselves. Nothing she can do or say will make them feel any worse. A few weeks then pass, with the ship's telescope trained squarely on the planet below. Each time it passes overhead, they focus on the several mile wide grave. There is nothing, no movement, no change, nothing but dust and dirt to be seen. Eventually, supplies running low, yet again, the pair wordlessly suit up and fly off, descending towards the planet. When they arrive at the site, they poke through the dust again and eventually find what's left of the man. His head is mostly in one piece, but the rest of him is just bits. The woman is missing, though. Eventually, they find a dust-covered trail of dried oil and blood and scratch marks that lead them to what's left of her, a few hundred meters up the crater wall, her dead eyes staring motionless into the dirt and no energy left to spark. Once the Frankenship has landed at what used to be Capsule Corp, and the rest of the crew have disembarked, they set about rebuilding what they can. On the plus side, the extended exposure to the likes of Gohan, Goten, Bra, and even Roshi and Chi-Chi to some degree, has led to an initial batch of three or four other crew members being taken under Roshi and briefly Gohan's wing. The few that had eventually learned how to fly in a full 1G were certainly handy to have around, and they make good use of this, spreading out, searching for materials, foodstuffs, and even, miraculously, other survivors. To be fair, the training was a welcome distraction. It's not like there was anything else to do in their spare time, in orbit, something they had plenty of as they watched the planet slowly spinning by, far below. Of course, floating around in 1G is all well and good, but as Videl would attest, in a different space and timeline, blasting your way through the air comes with several issues. A quick scrounging of available spacesuit helmets solves that problem, though, and their search finally begins in earnest. When Goten and Bra have celebrated their 15th and 14th birthdays, respectively, Bulma finally hears something useful from the space drones she sent looking for the Namekian ship. They had drifted for ages and finally landed on a planet populated by a rather friendly bunch. While the Ardratians lack space travel in the traditional sense, they do have other means, and so does their envoy, of a sort, in the form of Dende. Lacking anything to lock onto, however, they puzzle for a moment about how Dende could possibly get to Earth until Roshi hobbles over to Goten and says that he might be able to act as a beacon for them. Goten isn't entirely sure what the blind old master is talking about, until Bra steps up to say that, yes, his power was amazing, scarily amazing, when his hair changed color, just like Gohan's had when he, um, when he, she trails off, staring at the ground, trying but ultimately failing to hold back those tears. Once they compose themselves, Goten finally realizes that, just like his brother, he too could turn into that bright, golden-haired warrior thing that Gohan had somehow done. They are interrupted by the image of Dende on the screen, saying that Elder Mori thinks he knows what's up. The supposed Super Saiyan from the Namekian Book of Legends was said to have golden hair, and since they were, at least in part, Saiyan, maybe that's what it is. So Goten strains for a while to see if he can somehow go Super Saiyan, but not really feeling any different, he glances around sheepishly and just shrugs. The looks on Bra and Roshi's face, though, are quite telling, and while she may be harboring thoughts of her only remaining son becoming a delinquent, Chi-Chi finds a mirror to hand to her boy. His hair is golden and standing on end, 
The mirror also shatters in his grasp, and he finally notices the raw power flowing through him. He had just been straining so hard, and while he had felt his key continually increasing, he hadn't quite felt this supposed burst in power that Dende had implied would happen. Speaking of Dende, though, the Namekian on the fuzzy TV screen is smiling and nodding, saying that yes, yes, he thinks he can feel it. It's distant, but maybe... On the screen, he reaches for his forehead, and courtesy of a slight delay in the electronic components of the magic space communication tech, Dende gets to see himself on that screen a moment before the image of him vanishes, to be replaced by Elder Mori, and a strange-looking being with an oval head and funny clothing. After Master Pibara congratulates Dende on such a long-distance transition, they sign off. Dende is then filled in on the goings-on on Earth, before he in turn fills them on on the plight of the dozen Namekians that managed to cram themselves into that ship. After a few months of wandering from system to system, looking for a habitable planet that didn't reek of the freezer force, the Ardratians had eventually welcomed them with open arms, and even set aside a decent-sized area on their world for those wayward Namekians to settle and rebuild. There was also no hint of a time limit for their stay, so for the time being, they were safe, maybe. King Cold is still out there, though, so, you know. On the subject of Dragon Balls, Dende is happy to help, but he'd need to make them from scratch. Unless they... no... Do they at least have the model of the original? Luckily, Master Roshi knows where the lookout is. Unfortunately, the Western Peninsula is a pretty large area, and being blind, he can't exactly point to it on a map. Not that the thing should be that hard to spot from the air. Fortunately, though, Bulma finds it with minimal effort. While not working on her, um, side project, or trying to run the jury-rigged and cobbled-together space station, she had spent the rest of her downtime mapping the slowly devolving Earth below them. She knows exactly where the lookout is, and Dende, Goten, and Bra all fly off to the west. On the trip, Dende starts telling them about what little he knew of Gohan, back from when they were on Nemec, before, well, you know. He was sad to hear that the boy had fallen, but glad that he had found meaning. He'd always struck Dende as conflicted in his path as a warrior and scholar. It's a shame that his death had been over a year ago, as his soul may have moved on by now. Also, did he get to keep his body? It's not unknown to have people die and retain their bodies, but such occurrences are few and far between. Like Goten's dad, Goku. He'd mentioned something about that back on Namek, hadn't he? They find Korn's tower easily enough and make their way up to the top, then further up to the next level, and they find the lone Mr. Popo, sadly tending the flowers. Mr. Popo himself is thrilled to meet another Namekian, and immediately asks the boy about taking on the role of Guardian. Well, first things first, do they have the dragon statue? Yeah? Nice. Wakey wakey Shenron, eggs and dead people. And so, as Shenron looms over them, and Goten and Bra, who have never experienced this before, gawk back, we will bring part three to a close. Do you think Gohan's somewhat tortured soul would even want to come back, or would he prefer to rest? Having discarded his burdens, guilt being the topmost, and having ensured the survival of his trainees, through utterly annihilating his own body, perhaps he would rather rest in blissful nothingness. What of the other Z-Fighters? Would they have gone on to bigger and better things in the afterlife? This is the future timeline, after all, so, well, you know, they're kind of forgotten about. And can a dragon actually revive someone after so many years of death? The single time I can recall this happening is in Resurrection F, though would this Dende think to make that change here? Hopefully. Well, leave your suggestions and find out next time on Dragon Ball. What if Goku's spirit bomb actually worked?